Welcome to the multiverse, fellow planeswalker. I am Justine. I know this may all seem rather overwhelming, but trust me, it will all start to make sense as we go. To get you started, how about I break down some of the basics, yes? Well, as you may have gathered from a moment ago, there is more than one world out there. That's why we call it the multiverse. These worlds, also known as planes, are blocked from each other, and they very rarely intersect. Due to an extremely rare phenomenon, some folks are born with something called a spark. It allows them to travel between these different worlds. These people are called planeswalkers, like you and like me. Unfortunately, I can't stick around. I have some worlds of my own that need tending to. Why don't you go ahead, though, and join my friends around the fire over there? They will get you caught up on what's been happening, and I think that their story is just getting started. Our story begins on the Plain of Ravnica, in the Hall of the Guild Pact. Three unusual freelancers have been summoned with the promise of a job. Bartholomew Avenant, Surrey Windcaller, and Baffer Dribbledraw were assigned by Nassius Venn to locate, apprehend, and deliver the goblin crime lord Krenko to Guild Pact custody. With their mission in mind, the trio retired to Bartholomew's home to discuss the job and study the mission details given to them by their employer. Baffer quickly lost interest and fell asleep, leading Bartholomew to leave the room and prepare the dwarf's sleeping arrangements. In his absence, Surrey investigated the menagerie of books in Bartholomew's collection, only to find a book of scripture from her home plane of Innistrad. As she flipped the pages in disbelief, her host re-entered the room, and the two shared a touching moment before everyone retired to bed. In the morning, Bartholomew treated his guests to a hearty breakfast before they all left to visit Sawtooth Prison. There, they asked the Boros Warden for more questions about their quarry, and found out that Krenko had escaped a maximum security prison transport, and the Warden believed he had help from the Guild of House Demir. Leaving Sawtooth Prison, our party of bounty hunters found themselves in a difficult position. With little to no ideas of where to start looking for Krenko, they decided to visit some contacts throughout the city that they each knew to get more info. Bartholomew led them to New Prov, home of the Azorius Senate, to meet a kind spirit named Matram Sweet. Matram delivered some intel regarding the typical habits of Ravnik and crime syndicates, including the name of a warehouse district Balfour was familiar with. The group went to this district to meet a troll named Morbach, who, after some bribes in the form of pocket bacon, revealed a section of warehouses where some goblins had been seen recently. Sensing they might be close, our party followed Morbach's directions and found a dilapidated warehouse that seemed to be out of service. Recognizing some goblin sentries around the building, Surrey turned Bartholomew invisible so he could get closer and see if Krenko was inside. A few close calls later, Bart was discovered by a sentry, but after some quick thinking, he charmed the goblin and convinced him that he was doing a great job. Bart asked to speak to the goblin's boss, but an enforcer came out instead. Assuming things were going poorly, Balfour decided to light the warehouse on fire to smoke the inhabitants out. Unaware of the now growing blaze, Bartholomew tried to convince the enforcer to bring his boss outside. The enforcer didn't buy it and attempted to bring Bart inside while Balfour's fire continued to spread. It didn't take long for everyone to become aware of the flame, so Bartholomew and Surrey rushed into the warehouse to warn everyone inside of the impending danger. Now inside the building, the party spotted Krenko as he scrambled into a large piece of Lizard equipment. He activated the machine and tried to attack Bart while the enforcer landed a devastating blow to the back of Bart's head. Balfour rushed in to save his friend and quickly cleaved the Enforcer in half. With his men scattering, his Enforcer dead, and his warehouse ablaze, Krenko decided to run. 
He drove his machine out of the warehouse and into a nearby canal to escape his hunters. Bart used a quick detect magic spell to figure out that Krenko had crawled into a sewage pipe. Balfour, still angry that the goblins had attacked his friend, quickly jumped into the pipe to pursue, while Bart and Surrey struggled to follow suit. Balfour caught up to Krenko and knocked him out. After breaking the goblin's feet to ensure he couldn't run away, Balfour brought Krenko back to the surface, and Bart messaged Nassius Finn to receive the address for the drop-off point. Now knowing that they needed to take Krenko across the 10th district to Griffin Heights, the party decided the best mode of transportation would be the local railway system. They strapped Krenko's unconscious body to Balfour's back underneath his cloak, which allowed for a fairly uneventful railway trip until Krenko began to stir. The group had planned for this, however, so Suri pulled out a crowbar from her pack and tried to knock the goblin out again. Unfortunately, Krenko had sustained too much damage from their previous combat, so her strike was enough to finish the mob boss off. At the next stop, Bart led everyone off the train to try and heal Krenko, but it was already too late. Looking around to get their bearings, they realized that they had ended up near Orzova, the main chapel and bank of the Orzov Syndicate. Despite Bart's general dislike for the Orzov, he decided to take Krenko there to get help. As the group approached the church, they ran into Orpheus de Roe, a mid-ranking clergyman of the church that Bartholomew knew. Orpheus was eager to help Bart out with the promise of payment, so he invited the party inside to discuss things. A resurrection was possible, but not cheap. Bartholomew couldn't afford the monetary costs, so a deal was brokered. Orpheus would help resurrect Krinko, and in return, Bart would come back to answer some questions about his history and intentions in the 10th district. Begrudgingly, Bartholomew agreed to these terms, so Orpheus fetched a higher-ranking official named Mike Burick to perform the ritual. With Krenko alive, the party hurried to reach the meeting point and be done with this whole ordeal as quickly as possible. As they approached their destination, Bartholomew spotted a shadowy figure drop off a glowing blue note. Intrigued and a bit suspicious, he picked up the note to discover it was from House Demir. It said that they had released Krenko for a reason and that the group should not trust Nassius Venn. Bartholomew had already had some suspicions about Nassius, but he also knew that the Demir were rumored to be spies and saboteurs. Conflicted, the group decided to take Krenko to a bar that Surrey was familiar with, known as the Stress Swindler, to question the mob boss. At the Stress Swindler, Surrey reconnected with a friend and the proprietor of the establishment, Cynthia. A private room in the wine cellar was acquired, and the party took some time to rest while Krenko was still asleep. Unbeknownst to everyone, Krenko woke up and slipped out of his bonds. It wasn't until they heard the door creak shut that they realized he had escaped. Balfour and Surrey ran out the back door to circle around the bar while Bartholomew rushed into the tap room. Bart found Krenko first, followed quickly by some Azorius law mages. A charm spell and some quick words convinced the guards that Krenko wasn't who he seemed to be and got Krenko to come back to the cellar. Bart began questioning Krenko about what he might know, but the goblin was tight-lipped. Balfour returned to the cellar at the same moment Krenko spit in Bart's face, which angered Balfour immensely. He grabbed the goblin, dropped some caltrops on the floor, and began forcing Krenko to stand on them until he started talking. The screams of pain caught Cynthia's attention, and needless to say, she was not happy with what they were doing. Bartholomew, once again, managed to calm the situation, but Krenko required that Balfour leave the room. Changing tactics... Bart was able to finally convince Krenko to reveal what he knew. Krenko's men had taken a cleanup job after an ex it scientist's experiment exploded. Supposedly, the crew had discovered something strange, but when the Demir tried to get more info from the crew's memories, their minds were blank. Recognizing that the situation was more complicated than it had first seemed, Bartholomew decided to release Krenko. Balfour demanded to know why, but Bart insisted they wait until they could get back to his apartment to talk about what he had learned. The group slept at the stressed swindler and started making their way through town the next morning. Plans were shattered, however, as Bart received a telepathic message from both Nassius and Mike requesting everyone's presence at the Hall of the Guild Pact. In a moment of panic, Bart convinced Balfour and Surrey to planeswalk with him to Innistrad to escape Ravnica long enough to discuss everything.
After planes walking, Balfour and Bartholomew both ended up in the same forest, but Surrey was nowhere to be seen. Not moments after the two of them arrived, a priest of the Church of Avicen came through the trees with an axe in hand. Bart tried to calm the man down and express that he and Balfour were nothing to be afraid of, but the priest attacked regardless. During the fight, it became apparent the man was not in his right mind. After defeating him, Balfour felt bad for the man's fate, so he knelt to place a hand on the man's chest. To his surprise, magic began to flow out and across the man's body as Balfour unknowingly cast Spare the Dying and saved the priest's life. Now that the man was no longer dying, Balfour picked him up and the two adventurers set out through the forest to find civilization. Eventually, they found a road and began to follow it to a town in the distance. Along the way, they met a man who wore very fine clothes and carried himself with an air of authority. Since Bartholomew had been to Innistrad before, he recognized this man to be a vampire. The man introduced himself as Streffen Maurer, Lord of the Outlying Valleys. He traveled with Bart and Balfour briefly before transforming into a wolf and running away. Perturbed, Bart hurried the two along to get into town as quickly as possible. They took the unconscious priest to the town's local church to get help. The bishop, a man named Father Donovich, healed the priest and conversed with the two heroes about the madness the traveling priest had been suffering from. As they spoke, a scream could be heard from somewhere in the church. Bart and Balfour tried to ask questions, but the father became defensive and asked them to leave. Once out of the church, Bart commented on Balfour's temper as the two of them made their way to the tavern to find out how they were going to find Surrey. Meanwhile, back on Ravnica, a mysterious Demir operative named Erasmus Kane received a mission. He was to travel off-world and locate the band of adventurers that had become entangled in the Cranko mess. He was to deliver key information to them and report back. After investigating the home of Bartholomew Avenant, Erasmus planeswalked to Innistrad and found a lone Surrey. Seeing the rest of the group was missing, he decided to tail the young woman in hopes that she would find the rest of her crew. As they traveled through the woods, Surrey fell prey to a mind control spell from the living guild pact himself, Jace Bellerin. Jace ordered Surrey to kill Erasmus, which she attempted to do with a devastating attack that left Erasmus within inches of death. With the help of her patron, Surrey quickly shook off the mind control and turned on the mind mage. A fierce battle ensued but quickly turned sour for Surrey and Erasmus. In a moment of desperation, Surrey accepted an offer of help from her patron, allowing him to take over. This turned the tide of battle in Surrey's favor, and the mind of Jace was freed from an otherworldly force that had taken him. Before Surrey's patron could kill the mage, however, Erasmus landed one final blow that caused Surrey's patron to retreat violently. Unaware of what he had just done, Jace offered the two wounded individuals information and gave Surrey a sending stone so that she could contact him if she ever needed help. After that deadly encounter with the living guild pack, Surrey and Erasmus took much needed time to rest before setting out in search of civilization. Their path led them to a lake where Surrey hailed a man in a boat out on the water to ask for transport. The man said he would help under the condition that they don't ask any questions. They agreed and got into the boat to find a young girl bound and unconscious behind the man. After they had been taken most of the way across the lake, Erasmus broke their oath and started questioning the man. He revealed that there was something in the lake that granted him unknown boons, and in exchange he must feed it. Erasmus revealed his vampiric nature to frighten the man into leaping out of the boat and into the water to escape. Fearful that the man would attract the attention of whatever resided in the lake, Erasmus took control of the vessel and told Surrey to release the young girl from her bonds. Once back on shore and safe from the monster of the lake, the young girl tells Surrey and Erasmus that her name is Annabelle Bitterheart and her coven is not far away. She led her unlikely saviors to her family, who were overjoyed at the return of their daughter. The Bitterhearts informed Surrey and Erasmus that the two unusual strangers to these lands were spotted in the nearby town of Shadowgrange. After saying their goodbyes, the two began to make their way to this town in hopes that the two strangers were Bartholomew and Balfour. On the way, Erasmus decides to deliver his intel to Surrey so that he could return home. Her and her friends were wanted by the Azorius Senate for the murder of Nassius Venn. 
They weren't without allies, though. A man of no guild affiliation named Vincenzo Sirac was willing to help them. Erasmus gave Suri Sirac's address before planes walking home to recover and report. Dumbfounded by the news, Suri made her way into Shadow Grange and to the Blood of the Vine Tavern, hoping her allies were there. Already at the tavern, Bathor and Bartholomew were discussing how they were going to find Suri when she arrived and joined them at their table. She recounted what she had been through, but elected to not tell them of her patron's involvement in the fight. She told them of the information Erasmus had given her about the warrant for their arrest and the potential ally that they had. Bart and Baffer briefly told her of their adventures as well, before Bart paid for two rooms and the party retreated to one of the rooms to further discuss their options. As they spoke, Suri, in her absolute nature, absent-mindedly pulled out her packed weapon from her bag, which caught her companion's attention. Bart started to ask questions about the dagger and its connection to her power. She managed to dismiss any growing suspicions, and the group decided to rest for the night and make a decision regarding their next course of action in the morning. The next morning, the group reconvened and decided that they ultimately wanted to clear their names. Before returning to Ravnica, however, Bart and Balfour wanted to investigate the scream they had heard at the church. Suri made Balfour and, and herself invisible so that they could freely search the church while Bartholomew distracted the two priests. As they searched, they found a room in violent disarray that had a trap door in the floor. Balfour tried a number of ways to unlock the door before resorting to brute strength. With the door opened, an emancipated vampire spawn escaped and screamed. The scream caught Father Donovich's attention and drew him to the room. Seeing the father that had locked him up, the vampire spawn attacked and brought Father Donovich very close to death. The traveling priest that Bart and Balfour had encountered pulled Father Donovich away while our party battled the monster. The vampire spawn proved to not be much of a challenge, but its death took an emotional toll on the whole party. They had not expected to find Father Donovich's son as a vampire. Bart attempted to console the priest as Balfour and Surrey stepped out of the chapel to wrap their heads around what had just happened. Recognizing that there was nothing left for them to do, the party planeswalk back to Ravnica. As the party tried to planeswalk back, however, Bartholomew was detoured back to his home plane of Dominaria. After witnessing a father lose his child, Bart felt tugged through the blind eternities to his wife and children's graves. Overcome with emotion, he stayed there with them until he was approached by an old friend who was shocked to see him again. They invited him to their home to rest, which he gratefully accepted. The next morning, he visited the gravesite one last time before planeswalking back to Ravnica. There, he reconnected with Balfour and Surrey at the stressed swindler, and the group made their way to Vincenzo Sirac's address. On the way, they stopped at Orzova so Bart could drop off a note for Orpheus Duro. While they were there, Azorius guards spotted Balfour and Surrey and quickly arrested them. Bartholomew stepped in and convinced the guards to take them to someone with authority so that he could argue their case. The group was taken to the Senate and a trial began. Bartholomew recognized a zone of truth circle and willingly stepped into it. The Sphinx who presided over the case began questioning him. He revealed that they had fled the 10th district after releasing Cranko and that they were frightened of Nassius but that they had not murdered him. As the questioning continued, Vincenzo Sirac arrived and made a motion for the charges to be dropped. He revealed that an ally of his in the Golgari Swarm had cast the Speak with Dead spell on Nassius' body and asked who had murdered him. This evidence was enough and the murder charges were dropped. Vincenzo invited the party to his home and informed them that his assistance was not free. In return, he wanted them to return to Innistrad to steal an artifact called the Otherworld Atlas from the vampire lord Strephon Maurer. Vincenzo said they could take time to recover and rest, and that he would send an associate of his who would be able to assist them. With that whirlwind behind them, the party returned to Bartholomew's home. Bart filled Balfour and Surrey in on what he had learned from Krenko, and everyone went to sleep. The next morning, they were awoken by the arrival of an unusual moorfolk named Levin. Bart acquired breakfast for everyone while Balfour and Surrey got to know Levin. 
After breakfast, Bart left to go pay his debt to Orpheus while Balfour, Surrey, and Levin went to buy provisions for their upcoming trip. At Orzova, Bart found out that his failure to return and pay his debt in the agreed time frame meant he owed Orpheus another interview. Begrudgingly, he accepted and proceeded to answer Orpheus's questions. He stated his reason for coming to the 10th district, how he met his companions, and what his feelings were for the guilds. Satisfied for the time being, Orpheus released Bart to return home. Meanwhile, Balfour decided to purchase 25 pounds of bacon for their trip while Surrey bought actual traveling rations. Everyone reconvened at Bartholomew's house and Balfour cooked his bacon as Bart and Surrey taught Levin how to planeswalk. They described everything they could think of about Innistrad and specifically the Blood of the Vine Tavern to prepare her for the trip. Once everything was in order, everyone traveled one at a time back to Innistrad. Unfortunately, the planeswalk doesn't go quite to plan yet again. Balfour and Ciri managed to arrive in Shadowgrange, but Levin was not so fortunate. Recognizing that his new ally was going off chorus, Bartholomew chose to follow her so that she wouldn't be alone. After landing, he was able to figure out what direction they needed to go to meet up with their friends. On the way back to Shadowgrange, Bart and Levin ran into Streffen Mauer. He told Bart that if they met the Burgomistress in Shadowgrange, they should tell her that the wolf attacks wouldn't end until he had what he wanted. Bart inquired further, and they found out Streffen wanted the Burgomistress's daughter, Irina, to be his bride. Once Streffen was gone, Levin offered the option to trade Irina for the Otherworld Atlas, but Bartholomew was vehemently against that idea. The two of them hurried to Shadowgrange and met up with Balfour and Surrey. The group went to the Burgomistress's house to find out what was going on. She revealed that Lord Maurer was very interested in her daughter and asked if the party would be willing to help smuggle Irina towards the city of Lamas so she would be safe. The group agreed and set out the next day towards Lamas. This recap was produced by Realms of Roleplaying, with music and sound effects created by Monument Studios. The intro was narrated by Justine from the D&D podcast The Dungeon Boys, with all other narration performed by the cast of Fireside Dice. New episodes of Fireside Dice release on the second and last Friday of the month. Join us next time as the story continues.